COME 2012 380 and COME 2012 382 are being taken together, and these proposals have implication for road users. It is proposed that these proposals warrant further scrutiny. Negotiations on the proposals are ongoing. Therefore, the committee will write. Wait now. Can update. Is it? Cannot to scrutinise the proposals by requesting uh, a written uh, submission from the uh, stakeholders or indeed uh, from the department itself. Is that agreed? Discussing um, the, the motorcycles and the mopeds, I see there, there is a letter or a submission from MAG Ireland, the Motorcycle Action Group, yeah, which, that the, to, be, which they're actually uh, expressing their that concern that. about the, the, um, these regulations and they're, they're saying that. Um, you know, they're, they're saying that there would need to be specialist equipment and operative training and all that before this could be done. So, uh, you know, it's, it's just yeah. what happens. Yeah. Their yeah, submission is here yeah. this morning. We got that late last night. It's 10 o'clock okay. that arrived. But it does so, have a bearing yeah. on what we're talking yeah, about. It has, yeah, and that's why the department the, 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 the brief, the updates will be, when the updates, we will be updated sure. and the department will be brief. Okay. Chairman, could I suggest then that in addition to the other stakeholders that we have identified, that we look to the farming associations for their views, we look to the automobile association, um, to the various different people who are involved in um, the uh, older vehicles. There's, there's, a, there's, there's a myriad of organisations there that would have yeah. a view on this, and I think we should uh, try to, to have an exhaustive list as quickly as possible to circulate the um, proposal and, and look for a, a written response yeah. at the earliest opportunity. Does everybody agree with that? I presume they do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's agreed then. And thank you, ladies. Thank you very much. And I suppose now we're <coughs> waiting for the Department of Communications, Energy and Natural Resources, so the witnesses from there. Could I just ask something? I, I know that one of the visitors who is going to be in the gallery is slightly hard of hearing and who attended a, previous, uh, a meeting previously. And when, when people didn't speak into the microphone, he lost 50% of what the meeting right. So you're requesting that members speak through the microphone? Speak through the microphone. And also, uh, perhaps for future meetings, uh, if, if there were some sort of audio assistive technology that, that we might look at for people who were hard of hearing. Okay. And we have a new, there's a new screen here. That, that's what you're talking about, no? That the presentations can be shown on that. For, for, for people who are sure. orally challenged. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, I, I understand the frustration by, by it here, but the transcripts are. To welcome Kieran O'Hoban, Orla Ryan, and Kion Verbruggen, and Michael Hanrahan, who are appearing on behalf of the Department of Communications, Energy and Natural Resources. I wish to draw your attention to the fact, by virtue of Section 17.2L, the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to the committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled uh, thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to, given, uh, is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, person, persons or entity by name in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I also wish to draw 
to wish to advise you that the opening statements you have submitted to committee, committee will be published on the committee's web, website after this meeting. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside of the House or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Please proceed now with your presentation. So, uh, thank, uh, Mr. O'Hoban. Thank you, Chairman. Um, we have a short presentation to make, um, which the dear I ask now that you speak into the microphones, uh, there's a little issue with. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Uh, we have a short presentation and we have a, PowerPoint, a space on a PowerPoint, which you see is on the screen. Um, the re recent focus on the potential for shale gas uh, throughout the world has been particularly driven by the experience of the US. Um, in Ireland uh, and in, in other countries, concerns have been expressed really at two levels. Uh, in relation to the potential negative impact of utilising the technology itself of hydraulic fracturing and the, at a second level in concerns in relation to the scale of infrastructure that will be associated with a development project. In this short presentation, what I propose to do is to um, outline the authorizations that have been granted onshore Ireland to date and the type of work activities uh, covered. To touch on the EPA research, which uh, I understand EPA will be presenting here as well this morning, but to, to um, inform the committee of the link between that research and decision making for the department. To outline briefly the regulatory regime that would apply both at an exploration phase and if a project were to move to a development stage, the two different levels of uh, regulatory framework that would apply. And uh, we have a very short presentation as well in relation to groundwater issues. Uh, I think members of the committee will be familiar at this stage with the, the license options that were granted in February of last year. There are three licensing options, and they cover the counties listed there, uh, areas within the counties list, listed there of Cavan, Clare, Leitrim, Roscommon, and Sligo. They're for a two year period from February of last year, 1st of March last year, to the end of February next year. Key point being, they're licensing options, they're not exploration licenses. The works to be carried out and being carried out. Uh, it's primarily of a desk study nature. They don't involve intrusive work which you would have with an exploration license. And uh, in advance of that licensing round that resulted in the licensing options being uh, awarded, it was signalled and it is a condition of the licensing options that exploration drilling is specifically prohibited during the licensing option phase. Again, briefly, uh, because I think people do have a fair understanding of what a licensing option is. A licensing option is a form of a contract with the minister where it confers a first right of refusal for an exploration license. So th the purpose of it is very, very simple. It's where a company um, is not committing to the extensive type of program you would have with an exploration license, but is going to invest both uh, financial resources and time in looking at the data that's already there and considering potential. That they're given a space to do that, and then they understand that they will be the first party to be allowed to apply for an exploration license at the end of that process. That's all a licensing option is. By the end of February next year, the holders must decide if they wish to apply for an exploration license. And if an application is to be made, it must be supported by an environmental impact statement. Turning very briefly to the EPA research and uh, it, its, its importance to decision making from the department's perspective. Uh, again, the committee will know that the EPA carried out preliminary research uh, into the environmental aspects of hydraulic fracturing and published a report earlier this year in May. The DEPA is currently scoping a further more comprehensive study, and you'll hear more about that this morning. The key link between that research and decision making, the Minister has, uh, in, 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 in the House, has made very clear that no decision will be made to allow hydraulic fracturing until the results of this further EPA research have been considered. Turning um, briefly 
Uh, the next two slides deal with the actual regulatory framework that would apply at the two stages, both the exploration stage and if there were a production stage. A lot of the discussion to date has been more focused on the production stage, which would be you know, a large-scale development, significant number of paths, uh, you know, significant number of traffic movements. But there, there, would be, there would be an initial stage with any project, which is an exploration stage, which would be much smaller scale. The Minister has confirmed that having regard to the nature of the technology proposed, that even if the threshold provided by the EIA directive did not apply, that he would apply the EIA process to any application at the exploration phase. That environmental impact assessment uh, would be informed by advice and submissions from a range of parties, including the EPA, the National Parks and Wildlife Service, and then there's a list of bodies that the department would have to consult with. It's a, it's a long list of, of uh, bodies. It uh, would include NGOs, it would include the local authorities, and the process would also include a public consultation phase where the department would seek submissions from the public at large. Um, in addition, a safety permit will be required at the exploration phase when you look at the timing of it uh, from the Commission for Energy Regulation and the planning consent would also be required. So while, while um, I, I drew a distinction between the exploration and production phase in terms of scale, it's clear that at the exploration phase there is a detailed level of interrogation of an application and a number of consents that will be required. If you then move on and where where a project goes through the exploration phase, and that's a that's 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 an, 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 uh, that's a, an if question, and where it to demonstrate that there was the possibility of a commercial development, and you moved on to a development stroke production stage, there is a more significant number of consent processes that would apply. I've listed uh, them there on this slide. There would be a planning consent required. It would fall under the Strategic Infrastructure Act and a planning consent would be required from Board Tanala. A number of consents will be required from the Minister. Petroleum lease, a plan of development consent, gas pipeline consent. A safety permit would be required again from the Commission for Energy Regulation, an IPPC licence from the EPA and a Gas Act consent from the energy regulator to connect, the, to bring the gas to the national grid. There's a broad range of EU legislation uh, of relevance. I've touched uh, on some of it already, in particular on the EIA directive. The directives that are listed here might also be of relevance, uh, depending on the nature of the project. Um, we have a couple of slides here on groundwater, which Coon uh, Bruggen will bring you through, and then I will conclude the presentation, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just some slides in relation to groundwater. It's an area of concern. Uh, the Geological Survey, as part of the department, provide technical advice, um, independent geological advice, including in the area of groundwater, where we also work with, with the EPA. Um, just on groundwater use in Ireland, uh, the slide shows, although it's, it's rather smaller, the importance of it in relation to, to as a drinking water resource, and uh, also just taking some of the counties where it can be up to, up to uh, uh, Eighty percent of, of the water supply can be derived from it. Um, the, particularly in relation to groundwater schemes, where or group water schemes, where 68 percent of group water schemes serving uh, 20 or more people are supplied by groundwater boreholes or springs, and we're aware that there are up to maybe over 200,000 uh, private wells in rural areas not served by public or, or group water schemes, where groundwater is usually the only source of supply. Um, it's a rather detailed map, but uh, just to let you know that the, the level of uh, information we have uh, across all the country, just taking the northwest as, a, as an example, um, in this case looking at the actual groundwater resources or aquifers, where the water supply can be can be categorised based on how uh, how important it is uh, and how strategic it is. Uh, most of the rural houses and farms, as, as I said, will have their own bore in spring, um, and not all the boreholes are necessarily uh, known or mapped, but um, from what we the data we do have, the deepest uh, water supplies known in the area are approximately 100, 140 metres. Um, this is an additional map where we actually uh, produce, uh, as part of risk assessment, the groundwater protection 
uh, groundwater vulnerability map showing you uh, the areas that are most, where the groundwater is most at risk from surface contamination, it should be pointed out. So by combining the importance of the aquifer with the thickness of the cover and the nature of the geology, we can produce these planning maps which are used by the, by the local authorities and in development plans. Um, just a, a final note on contamination pathways. Um, the most uh, considered the highest threat is, is actually contamination from the borehole, where uh, we look to engineering solutions to ensure this doesn't happen. Um, in relation to uh, secondary importance would be gas leakage from below the, the aquifer along fractures. Um, it should be pointed out that from what we know of the geology, existing faults would, are, are relatively tight in the area and um, seismics or acoustics are used to, to both monitor and, and model the process. Uh, uh, finally, in, in terms of gas exploration within or adjacent to the aquifer, which could cause lateral migration, um, this would seem to be unlikely due to lack of permeability or large lateral distances involved, but is also considered a potential source of contamination. Okay. Uh, and to conclude, Chair, um, Chairman, the, as outlined, the authorizations granted are licensing options. They provide a first right of reply, and that's all. Our, a first right to apply, sorry. Um, no application has been made to date to drill an exploration while using hydraulic fracturing. Uh, the EPA, as we have outlined, is currently scoping further research. And that research, I mean, it, it will be important for, the, it's, it will be important for uh, the regulators, but it will also be important for any company that's considering applying for an exploration license. They will have to carry out their own environmental assessment. But included in that, they would have to build into that the findings of the, research, of the EPA research. And then to conclude, as stated already, the Minister has confirmed that no decisions will be made to allow hydraulic fracturing until the results of the further EPA research have been considered. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Thanks now for your presentation. I know that people would like to ask some questions, so who's ask it. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very grateful uh, to Mr. O'Hobine and to the uh, officials of his department. Uh, I think it's vitally important that the um, information that is provided in this committee is conveyed to the wider public because of the way concerns that have been expressed, uh, particularly and specifically in the areas uh, where hydraulic fracturing has been proposed to be carried out. Uh, a couple of questions, one of which relates to um, a comment that was made earlier that um, the license application option that, they, that at the end of February that the existing license holders must take a decision on whether to apply for an exploration license or not. Now, um, in light of that, um, Tamboran, who have chose not to come before this committee, in the course of a letter to the committee indicated that um, they were aware that a special study into shale gas had been set up by the EPA, which will be reporting in about 12 months, and that until that time they feel that discussions will not be meaningful. We do not believe it is productive to make detailed comment on project impacts until the requirements of the EPA and other regulatory agencies are defined. Our schedule is predicated on the above EPA report and then the strict regulatory and planning mechanisms that will be in place. We expect the project will be allowed to advance at least to the test well stage once these regulatory and planning requirements are known and we will point out that this is unlikely to be before 2015. Now in light of that, does it mean that their license application will fall? That by February it seems from this letter that they would not be in a position to apply for an exploration license because they are awaiting the outcome of uh, further research. So what are the implications of that um, for any license, uh, any license holder? Um, also, um, you pointed out that um, there are a number of EU regulatory regimes in place that would have an impact and would be relevant to the final decision in relation to this. In a question that was put by two members of the Green Party in the European Parliament, uh, to the environmental DG um, in July, uh, a reply said that as a quote, as part of its ongoing effort to determine whether the level of human health and environmental protection provided by the existing EU legislation is appropriate, the Commission has initiated work in order to assess by end 2013 
whether or not there is a need for a risk management framework for shale gas developments in Europe, both at the exploration and commercial production phases, and if necessary, the form that it would take. What input are you, as a department, having into these discussions with the DG Directive, with the, with the DG Environment? Um, are, are, are you in actively engaging with them in terms of what seems to be an ongoing research and analysis as to whether the existing legislative framework Europe-wide uh, will, will, will be sufficient? Because, as you will be aware, there are several European countries have already suspended or have introduced a moratorium on shale gas exploration. So this is a European-wide issue, not just exclusive an Irish one. So what feedback would you have into that? But for the moment, there are the two things I'm concerned about. Is it OK? Because we have other groups coming in. Is it OK if we take all the questions first and then we work back to it so we can take a note of them? Right, next. Uh, first thing I'd say is I, I, I live my, my family and I live, I suppose, five or six miles from what would be the centre of operations here. So people talk about conflicts of interest. I most certainly have a conflict of interest here. Um, I think it's a pity that this meeting isn't been held in North Leitrim. It's been held in Kildare Street. I think at some stage members of this committee need to meet up in North Leitrim to see the countryside and the community that we're talking about. And Chairman, I would formally propose that, that a meeting be held in the site of what would be the centre of fracking operations. And I'll ask whether that can be arranged. I will facilitate a nice conference room uh, that, that would be capable of uh, accommodating the meeting. I think it's disappointing, to put it mildly, that Tamboran Resources didn't see fit to attend this meeting. And the reason they put forward is that it's difficult to engage in meaningful discussions at this stage. Yet, in their own words, they continue to work closely with the relevant government departments in establishing, establishing a dialogue with all stakeholders. So they're saying they don't have enough information to talk to legislators, but they have enough information to go and talk to the community. Is it any concern, is it any wonder that the community have concerns about the validity of the information that's been passed at those meetings? But had Tamborn Resources been here, I would certainly have asked them to explain. There are fairly recent credible reports which call into serious doubt their projected figures in relation to the estimates of gas that are available the average well performance and the projected well life, and which also call into serious question the projected development costs, income projections, job number projections, and critically, the state income projections. My position on this, as I say, I have a vested interest here. My, my, my position on this is, is, is very clear. I believe it would constitute the worst form of social and environmental vandalism to turn a beautiful landscape of North Leitrim into what would be, and, and subsequently Fermanagh, Cavan, Sligo, Tyrone, Donegal, into what would be an industrial wasteland and put at risk our vital agri-food and tourism industries for the potential financial gain of a small number of people. That's my position. Okay. Um, uh, no questions. Can you put a question? Yeah. Questions. I have a number. I'm sorry, Chairman. I have a number of questions. Okay. They're valid questions, yeah. and I have to be given the time right. to we'll ask these the questions. Yeah. Thank you. The first question has been answered in the introduction. I, I, uh, I, I take it as a typographical error. Holders must decide by the end of February 2013, not 2012. Yeah. yeah. 
who, who makes the decision to grant or to refuse an exploration or a production license? And what input, if any, does this committee have in reaching that decision? Are we a talking shop or do we have real input into that decision? Is there any provision within legislation for a Dáil vote on a decision of such crucial importance for this nation going forward? In my view, there's so little known about the impact of fracking. People are talking about experiments that are going to be work that's going on in Poland and in the States. North Leitrim is different. The ground is different. The scenery is different. And under the ground is totally different to what's going on in Poland or in the United States. In my view, it'll be at least 10 or 20 years before we have anything near enough information to make a decision on this technology. So could, could you advise me in relation to your estimates as to the likely time scale we're talking about? to reach a decision regarding the Loch Allen Basin. And I'm talking about a time scale for exploration, because that would be the beginning of the damaging of North Leitrim. Uh, have, are, we, are we as a, a government, as a parliament, are we doing enough to exploit wind, wave, tidal energy, on and off our extensive Atlantic coast? Are all our eggs going into the fracking basket? I know that the department have initiated work in relation to energy conservation measures, but given that domestic dwellings account for 40% of our energy use, Surely we should be doing an awful lot more in terms of energy conservation measures on domestic dwellings. I have serious concerns that a company which is at the initial stages of applying for an exploratory license are offering so-called unconditional grants to community organisations. Oftentimes these organisations, almost always, they're cash-strapped organisations who are desperate and will take money from, from whatever source. I believe it's unethical that companies are offering these so-called unconditional grants to community organisations. It has the potential to cause serious rifts within a community. The last thing we want here, Chairman, is another Rossport. And I think that we, government, the department, and any company involved in it, has to be very, very careful in, in, in relation to fermenting discontent within a good community. Also, I'd ask the question, are payments such as that allowable as tax allowable expenses if the company is subsequently granted a license? Because that would be the irony of ironies that the taxpayer is paying community organisations to, to, to ferment dissension within the community in order to get a grant for a company. I have just three more questions, Chairman. I'll finish that. I, have last I know you have, I, I, and I appreciate it, Chairman. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I'd ask, how does, how does the department, how can the department independently evaluate 
the various figures put forward by any company in support of their, their, their case for an exploration licence. Given there's such a paucity of information here in relation to geological uh, data, and how would the department enforce commitments that are made by any company, given the possibility that the company could sell on once they have got planning permission or engage in a joint venture with another larger company. And finally, Chairman, and, and, and this is the bit that, that really, really ha has, has got me. Two weeks ago, we had the Commissioner for the EU Commissioner for Energy Regulation, and his advice to member states unofficially would be not to make a decision for three to five years, there's work going on, the state is still coming in. That gave me some reassurance until I get a newsletter until I get a newsletter the EU news bulletin published by the Irish Regions Brussels office September 2012 issue 94 and lo and behold, I see that there's a budget set aside of 200,000 euro to cover five or six hearings and campaigns with the view to organizing early stage dialogue with citizens and to launch information campaigns on shale gas as a basis for information decision, decision making on its potential industrial exploitation. So here, here's the way I see it, Chair. And here's the way I think a lot of the community in North Leitrim will see it. You had an EU Commissioner saying there's not enough information there at the minute. Wait and see what happens. You have a company who will not appear before this committee because they're saying it's too, e it's too early to meet you guys, ye legislators. But they can go out and talk to communities and split them. We don't have enough information, and I, 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 I would ask the department, what is the gap between what we need to know and what we, what we actually know at this point in time in relation to what's on the ground? And why, if we're at such an early stage, this is why people think, uh, think that what we've been doing, uh, what's happening here is we've been dumped, bumped down a, a, a rosy path in the garden. That decisions have already been made and that the community are being channeled in a certain direction. And this, Chairman, seems to bear that out. You have a lot of questions. Yeah. Right. Okay. John. Thanks, Chairman. I'll be a lot briefer than that, uh, but I do accept the... I just said the committee members speak to specific because we have other presentations as well. Yeah, so. could I just, just on a clarity, a couple of small brief questions. Um, just in relation to the licensing options that have been taken up in the various counties that you mentioned, is it just the Tamboran company that have... Are, have they taken up all of those licenses or are, they, are there other companies? involved in, in some of those places. Secondly, which are, you, you mentioned about the licensing option running out in, in February 2013 um, and uh, that that would fall at that stage and they have to apply for a, um, an expiration license at that stage. Could, is, is, there a, is there a possibility that they could apply for um, a continuation or an extension of the licensing option? Um, at that stage, in the view of what they've said to us here today about not appearing because there's further reports and environmental reports to, to, to technology and so on to, to, to be progressed. Um, or does it, I mean, does it mean on the face of it, if they cannot do that, then does it mean that the interest in, lice, in, 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 in fracking in Ireland dies at 2013 if, if there's no other companies involved? 
uh, I hope I've made myself uh, clear on that. Okay. Thanks, thank you, Chair. Uh, Deputy Lukeming Flanagan. Um, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chairperson. Uh, I, just the first thing I want to say is, uh, is, is anyone uh, going to – I'm not a member of this committee, so I, it, it, I, it, I don't think I can second your proposal for, uh, for the officials to come down uh, to Leitrim to actually look at the situation on the ground, because I think it is very, very important, because there's many decisions made – whether that be bus routes or whatever, where they don't actually go out and talk to people and see exactly what it is like there on the ground. You can do uh, stuff on a desktop all you want, but if you don't go out and see the ground you're dealing with and talk to the people that you're dealing with, well, it's a waste of time. And uh, I'm just wondering, would you be able to do that? And uh, uh, Deputy Colreavy mentioned uh, we don't want another Rossport. We so, so most certainly don't. So that's the reason why, if this... Uh, people not only need to be consulted, uh, but they actually need to be listened to. And we don't need consultation that involves the equivalent of the arrow being fired first and then the target drawn around it, uh, just to uh, make it look like there was consultation. So, like, there needs to be real consultation. And if the people in that area don't want it, then it can't happen because uh, it's their area, they're the people who have to live there. And uh, I, I, what I'd like to know is how much are you going to take into account the opinions of people? Because I have a vested interest as well. Uh, I'm living in Roscommon. We depend 70, the figures were there, I knew them already, but 70% of our water, drinking water, comes from groundwater. And if it does get contaminated, it's not quite as simple uh, to uh, uh, decontaminate it. In fact, it's pretty much impossible. So um, uh, if ever there was precaution needed, it is here, because, uh, OK, we need energy, but uh, I know we need water a lot more. So I, what I want to know is, will the people's opinions really be taken into account? And also, I'm uh, wondering, uh, I'm sure you're aware of this study uh, that was put out by the European Parliament, uh, specifically pointing out uh, uh, how you had to be very, very careful in sensitive areas going down the road of... Uh, Fracking. I'd just be interested to, uh, to see what uh, comments you have to make about that. And I just finish by saying it's uh, very worrying and very disappointing that uh, Tambourum Resources uh, would, not, would not come here today. It doesn't do an awful lot for confidence, because confidence isn't particularly high in them as it stands. So I think they've done themselves more damage here. That's all I have to say. Chairman, if there's a requirement uh, to formally second. Well, hold on now. What, we, we, we can, we don't, what, we can, what I think we should agree or we can do is to visit it rather than, than you know, have a meeting down that the committee should visit the area and I think that would be quite acceptable. That's what you were suggesting. Yeah, I, I, I thought it would be an efficient use of time to have a committee meeting in North Leitrim and I, I could arrange a venue, yeah. a suitable venue. Yeah, right. Well, we'll, we'll take up a visit. Uh, I, I, I think not, not trying to read into Deputy Kareeby's mind, I think what, he, what I'd like to think he has in mind is that not only that we would inform ourselves as a committee on the ground, but that we would have an opportunity to engage with some of the local opinion. Okay. Is there any, any? No. Yeah, okay. Right, just maybe something, a clarification before I, I, I go back. Is which department? Is it the Department of the Environment or, or, or uh, the Department of your department that would be issuing? A license and when you know when do you think they would actually a date when a, an actual license uh, may be issued uh, if you think so just as really it's so over to you okay thank you chairman um th th there's a there's a lot of questions there but two of them are two there's two themes to which brings together a lot of the questions i think is what happens next in terms of the application process um, and what the timelines associated with that would be and what the elements of that are. I'll come to that first. The second is in relation to, you know, reference has been made to a number of studies that have been completed, uh, that are ongoing, and how, how, they, how they feed into the process. Um, so maybe I'll start with those two themes and then run through the questions as best I can. In, in relation to the, the, uh, the application process, the obligation on the companies is that they have a licensing option which gives them a first right over others to apply for an exploration license. And if they wish to exercise that right, they must do so before the end of February next. So what, 
what we could expect is that there are three licensing options, three different companies in different parts of the country that have those licensing options, just to answer Deputy O'Mahony's question, that they will make their decision independently before the end of February next year as whether they wish to apply. If they do wish to stay involved in the process and they wish to exercise that right, they would need to apply. The key point there is that any such application that application and that application process, it has to be supported by an environmental impact statement. And it has to, and the Minister has said it, that that process and the evaluation of that application will be underpinned by a full environmental impact assessment. The Minister has also said that that assessment cannot conclude until the findings of the further EPA research have been, have, have, there's been an opportunity to consider those findings. So that's, that's the first thing to, to give you an understanding of timelines. In, in relation to the process, just to be clear, there is nothing in the statutory process that indicates the, um, the timeline by which that environmental assessment must be concluded. Now that's important. Uh, it's important from the perspective that no company has a right to make an application and demand uh, demand a response. So the application process will take the length the application process takes and as I said a key element in that process in the evaluation will be the findings of the further EPA research. So to put a timeline on it and I think you'll have to wait for the next presentation to understand that element of it. If po post that uh, research being concluded. I'm not going to uh, preempt its findings because, in the first instance, it's going to, you know, it, 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 it'll be a scientific, it'll be scientific research, and it will come to conclusions. If those conclusions leave it open to uh, to, to a, a, a project advancing to an exploration stage, then the full evaluation of the application and the environmental uh, impact statement and the environmental impact assessment process will begin. <laughs> you could anticipate that that process, if it, if, it ran, uh, if, if it ran well, and if there wasn't a need for additional information, would be an eight or a nine month process, but it could be over a year. So you would have to allow time at the end of the EPA research for the company and the regulatory bodies to consider that research, and then you would have to allow a nine to 12 month period for an assessment of an application. So that's, that gives you an understanding on timeline. In relation to the range of, of, of um, studies that have been completed and that are ongoing, clearly they will, they will, feed, into, um, they, they will feed into the project that, that, that the EPA is embarking on. Um, so the, the, aim is to, uh, to, 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 the, the aim is to conclude with uh, a scientific-based understanding of the potential impacts of hydraulic fracturing in Ireland and for that to inform decision making going forward. Um, just to run through the, some, of, some of the other questions, um, the, the potential environmental and social impacts, they would be addressed through those consent processes and you, you brought it back to Deputy Kilgreavy to the, at the expiration stage. So there will be an environmental impact assessment of any application for an exploration license and that environmental impact assessment has to take account of community issues, the uh, of environmental impact of social impacts. In relation to who determines whether exploration, the exploration phase can go ahead, there are a number of consent bodies. Clearly the exploration license is a matter for the Minister, but um, as, as the presentation outlined, there is a planning consent required and there will be a safety permit required from the, uh, from, from, the safety, from the Commission for Energy Regulation. In relation to the role for the Oireachtas, well, I think you understand the role for the Oireachtas as, 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 as well as anyone. The, the role for the Oireachtas, uh, as I would see it, is that the legislation that will determine the manner in which such applications um, uh, have to be considered is set down by the legislature. A point, a point that is raised um, at times in relation to the discussion around unconventional gas, Chairman, and this is relevant to a point um, raised by Deputy Karevi, is the trade-off between the use of gas versus the use of renewable energy sources. I think the key point there for Ireland, and this is not, this is, this is, it, would, it would relate to unconventional if unconventional was an acceptable way to proceed, and it's also relevant to conventional in the offshore. The key point there is that 
there is going to be a continued high dependency on gas uh, in our energy mix. And clearly, there's a benefit for Ireland if that gas is actually indigenous gas and we're getting, we're get, we are getting a financial return from it. In relation to company figures, the department doesn't comment on um, projections made by exploration companies involved um, at the early stages or at the exploration stage. The only time the company figures actually matter is when you get to the point where they're making the case that they have a commercial development, commercial discovery. So that, you know, you, you will often see um, news reports in advance of exploration drilling of what a company predicts, you know, based on the science as is, might be the potential of an area. You need exploration drilling to confirm that, and you would need significant amount of appraisal drilling before you would get to the point of being able to t determine um, with, with great certainty, or with anything close to great certainty, what the reserves are. In relation to enforcing commitments, um, the department has, has, a, it, it has a, um, a strong control there in that any authorization holder at an expiration phase, or if later they were in a development production phase, if there is to be a change in ownership, that requires the consent of the minister, and the obligations entered into by the initial party would have to transfer in that process. Um, you, you asked a question in relation to the gap in knowledge. Clearly, the, the uh, core aim of the EPA research is to identify what the extent of that gap is and to address it, but I, I leave that to the, to the next presentation. Sorry, to go back to the consent issue there about sure. the transfer, could you just elaborate on that? Because that's a matter of concern that this is a, a front organisation for a larger, that they will sell out to a larger multinational. So what's the context in which that could happen? It's, it's, it's very common, um, it will be very common that the company that would commence at the expiration phase of a project um, with 100% interest would at a minimum dilute its interest as it advances through the stages um, of expiration towards development. Uh, and, and that would be so as to, to, to share, to, to broaden the risk uh, before you get to invest significant monies. In the event though that it was a company was actually withdrawing, was selling, you know, that there was, a change in, there was a change in control of the company or that it was withdrawing and, and selling its share over to its partner. That requires the consent of the minister. And the key, the key issues for the, the, the minister in considering that would be whether or not the partnership has been strengthened by the change in control. But the, the principal point and the most, most, the most important point is that it doesn't in any way change the obligations that go with that authorization. They, they continue. Does that answer the point? Just as a brief question now. Very brief. I will chair you. I have a presentation. I'm more concerned than I was. We speak about the process that the department would use to grant an exploratory license. Is it within the gift of the minister and the department, or would there be legal implications for the minister or the department to follow the advice of the EU regulations commissioner and say, for the moment, we do not wish to offer uh, uh, the tendering of applications for exploratory licenses? Can the Minister say, for the moment, we are not proceeding with a request for applications for exploratory licences? Okay. Okay, the, um, I, I won't seek to put myself in the mind of, of the Commissioner in relation to what he said when before the Committee, um, but I think it would be fair interpretation to see it as being to uh, adopt a precautionary approach which I think is consistent with what Ireland is doing. Um, if, if, you, if you do nothing for a period, you will potentially be in the same place that you are now. And what Ireland is doing is doing something positive in terms of addressing the, the, the science that's needed to underpin uh, a decision. So we recognise that 
if an application is made for an exploration license, that that would have to be evaluated under the framework that's there, but that there is a gap there at present in terms of the science, and we're, we are uh, seeking to address that gap. Um, in terms of the timeline that I outlined uh, earlier, Chairman, and I leave DPA to outline to you the timeline for that research, what I outlined was that before any decision could be made by the Minister on an application for an exploration licence, you would have the EPA research, you would have time to consider its findings, and then you would have the 8 to 12 month process of the evaluation under the DIA directive. Clarify there, just in relation to the Commissioner and we have the before the committee, just to tell the Commission or Europe, they can't tell Ireland to do it. We can do it, you know, it's up to ourselves. Isn't that the, am I clear on that? The, well, the, the, I, I think I, 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 I read the transcript of the meeting, and I, I, I think the commissioner was uh, was simply was, was giving a view, responding to a question. But I think in the same meeting, that point was actually clarified. Um, yeah. I think in response to a question from Deputy Clarivi, uh, yeah. that our Ireland uh, our Ireland can set its energy policy. Yeah. Okay. Brent. So can I uh, allow those uh, people? Brief supplementary. Within the last couple of days, the British Chancellor of the Exchequer has announced that he is going to reduce the royalty tax rate for hydraulic fracturing operations in the UK, which I think is a very sinister development because, as you know, there is already activity going on in Fermanagh, uh, which is uh, right across the border. And as we know, um, the border is rec not recognised. I mean, it's the same operational area out of which this shale gas could be extracted. So it's affecting both sides of the border in that sense. Um, are, are you aware of this initiative and what input, if any, can you make through the variety of, um, of boards, or the variety of access that the Irish government has, for example, the British Irish Ministerial Council and now the North-South Parliamentary Tier and other, other methods? Uh, because obviously this is a matter of great concern. I mean, it will, it, it will spill over into the South uh, if it provides a direct financial incentive to companies to engage in hydraulic fracturing. Okay, I, I, I don't think, Chairman, that I'll um, enter into the debate on the UK tax policy. I am, though, I am aware of the consultation, and it's a consultation that has been commenced. I think the important point, though, um, from the point of view of recognising the point that Senator Mooney has made in terms of the geology doesn't recognise borders, um, that any, uh, on either side of that border, in the event that there was to be an assessment, um, an environmental impact assessment, it has to take account of potential cross-border impacts. Uh, and any project in Northern Ireland is subject to the same uh, EU legislation, legislative framework that it would be in, in, in this jurisdiction. Okay. Can I thank Sorry. sorry. Uh, I'm not sure whether you would allow this or not. You have a senior geologist here. I'm just curious to know, have you established within the department any facts on the ground? Because the only facts we're getting, or the only figures we're getting, I'll use that word, are coming from Tamboran as to what is actually under the ground and what it is they can extract. Now, I know that you've touched briefly on this, but I think it might be important for to find out what is the Department's own view, because we haven't heard anything from the Department. I'm sure you must have carried out your own seismic studies. You also have a body of evidence going back over 30 years, which Tamboran themselves are using in order to establish their particular bona fides, such as it is. So if you have any comment to make that would be helpful in that regard, I think I'd like to hear it. Um, firstly, the, um, there is a body of evidence over the years. It's very limited. There are um, a total of five wells in the northwest, five or six, five, I think. They were drilled for conventional um, uh, gas exploration, so they were targeting thin sand intervals, vertical wells. Um, most recent work was done by Evergreen Resources back in 2000. This is the first time that work has been done on evaluating the shale gas potential in the area. The data, the seismic data, is very old. Its quality is, is questionable. Um, it's, it would need a lot. It would need reprocessing work, and may even need a new acquisition to properly 
to, 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 uh, to aid in the interpretation uh, and, and to help evaluate what the potential is there. But as uh, Mr. Hoban said there, um, with regards the, in the same way in the conventional sense of shore, the only time the unintended department would actually get involved in actually evaluating what the size of the resources or what the potential recoverable or, or gas in place figure is there is once exploration and appraisal work has been done. And to date, no exploration work has been done for shale gas potential. The figures are questionable that are being put out by the company. Well, that would be the inference. I mean, that's their figures, it's, 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 and we haven't, we haven't evaluated them at this stage. Yeah. Is there a question? Sorry, no. Jim, yeah, just a question. Yeah, this is a final yeah. one now, does Yeah, thank you. Uh, does exploration permit hydraulic fracturing in North Leitrim? There, there is no exploration license in North Leitrim. Would uh, exploration license permit hydraulic fracturing in North Leitrim? I think, Chairman, that's the whole point of, of what we've been trying to outline here today, is that there is a process in place to help inform decision-making where such an application is received. And the EPA research and the findings of that research will be, you would expect that they will both inform the company's uh, decision as to whether they can make a determination that they can carry out this work without significant adverse impacts on the environment, and then also inform the regulator's uh, assessment of that application through the environmental impact assessment process. Right. So the reason that I asked the reason I asked the question was that there are wide variants between what is proposed to be taken out or what is supposed to be there and what can be taken out. I presume that you're watching this with you. And, and that is the same for conventional offshore exploration, where companies, when they take out a license, they would map a prospect, they would give a figure, but that figure is unproven until such a time as the exploration and appraisal work has been carried out. Thank you very much. Can I thank Ms. Ryan, uh, Mr. Hoban, Mr. Ver Ver Brogan, and Mr. Hanrahan. You're now excused. And thank you very much for your information. Mr. Brogan. For a minute until we get the EPA.
we'll, we'll reconvene. Uh, I just, uh, there is a section that I need to read out, but you were in the room at the time, so you understood, you understand it? Yeah. So, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to welcome Laura Burke, uh, Director General, Dara Leonard, Frank McGovern, and Sean O'Donoghue of the EPA. So, it's over to you, whichever will make the presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for inviting the EPA here today to assist the committee in formulating its views on hydraulic fracturing. Um, I have approximately a 10, 11 minute uh, statement that I hope will assist the committee. Uh, first of all, just with regard to the role of the EPA, as I'm sure you're aware, the EPA is an independent statutory body uh, established in 1993 under the EPA Act, and we have a wide range of responsibilities in the environmental field. Uh, for today's discussion, um, with regard to fracking, the main role with, uh, for the EPA with regard to projects involving hydraulic fracturing or fracking is its regulatory role through our IPPC licensing process, which is set out in the EPA Act. Um, an IPPC license is required for onshore extraction of shale gas on a commercial scale. The EPA does not have a regulatory role at the exploration stage of these projects, but will be a statutory consultee with respect to any environmental impact assessment conducted by the Department of Communications, Energy and Natural Resources, as indicated earlier. The agency is also involved in research into the environmental impacts of fracking and I might just briefly talk about each of our roles. Um, in the first instance, just the research role. The EPA is responsible for the development, coordination and management of environmental research in Ireland and has provided funding for environmental research since 1994. The current research programme, STRIVE, has been running since 2007 and is focused on major environmental challenges and the provision of policy-relevant analysis and research. The study, Hydraulic Fracturing or Fracking, a short summary of current knowledge and potential environmental impacts, was published by the EPA in May 2012. This short desk study was conducted for the agency by the University of Aberdeen. It provides an introduction to the environmental aspects of fracking, including a review of the regulatory approaches used in other countries and areas for further investigation and research. In brief, some of the findings of the research were, firstly, the importance of well integrity for preventing groundwater contamination, the importance of knowledge of local geology regarding potential impacts on groundwater quality and the possibility of tremors, the uncertainty regarding the carbon footprint of shale gas in comparison to conventional natural gas, and this is an important climate change issue, and also the small number of published peer-reviewed scientific studies in this area. The study also examined regulatory approaches in Europe, North America and elsewhere, and identified areas where further research is required to determine best practice. The information provided by this preliminary research project will now be used to inform a more comprehensive study to be commissioned by the EPA in cooperation with the Department of Communications, Energy and Natural Resources. This project will be uh, administered by the EPA programme and steered by a committee with representatives from DC and OR, the Department of Environment, Community and Local Government, the Commission for Energy Regulation, Onboard Planola, the Geological Survey of Ireland and the Northern Irish Environment Agency. The EPA expects to commission this study in 2012. The scope of the research, while not finalised, is expected to address, among others, the areas of environmental back best practice, identification of potential environmental impacts, local and global, and associated mitigation measures, baseline studies to characterise the existing local environment and an examination of regulatory frameworks in the Republic, Northern Ireland and the EU. <coughs> the study will take account of existing international research in the field and a public consultation is also planned. While elements of the research will relate to specific regions where options have been granted from DCNR, it is the intention that the study will generally be applicable to the island of Ireland. With regard to international research on hydraulic fracturing, there is currently much research underway, as indicated earlier, uh, particularly in the EU and the US, on the environmental and human aspects 
of fossil fuel activities involving fracking. As recently as September 2012, the EU Commission has published two studies in this area on both climate impact and the environment and human health. The EU Commission has also recently invited tenders for research aimed at supporting possible Commission initiatives on managing impacts and risks arising from unconventional gas developments and assisting the Commission in developing regulatory best practice. In the US, the US EPA is currently conducting research on potential impact of these projects on drinking water resources, and this research is expected to be completed in 2014 with an interim report at the end of 2012. The agency will, of course, keep abreast of all such research with a view to being in the best possible position to perform our statutory duties. As I indicated earlier, the primary role of the EPA with regard to fracking is our licensing role, and any proposed project involving the commercial scale extraction of shale gas would need to, be, to apply for the, to the EPA and be granted an IPPC licence in order to operate. Any licence issued for such an activity would also regulate the environmental aspects of any hydraulic fracturing operations taking place as part of the extraction activity. IPPC licences aim to prevent or reduce emissions to air, water and land, reduce waste generation and to use energy and resources efficiently. Applicants are required to demonstrate that they meet the criteria set out in the legislation to be considered as fit and proper persons to hold such a licence and must make adequate uh, provision for closure and environmental liabilities. The, the IPPC licence is a single integrated licence which covers all emissions from the facility and its environmental management. All related operations that the licence holder carries out in connection with the activity are controlled by the licence. In order to grant licence, the agency must be satisfied that emissions from the activity do not cause a significant environmental impact. Any application to the EPA must demonstrate the use of best environmental practice in order to minimise environmental impact. Applicants are also required that the proposed activity would not cause any breaches of national or European directives. For example, with regard to protection of groundwater, an applicant would be required to show that no breaches of the Water Framework Directive or national water quality standards would occur. No IPPC licences for commercial extraction of shale gas have been received by the agency to date, and any application received in the future will be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis in accordance with the requirements of the EPA Acts. Among the key environmental issues to be addressed in any future application would include potential for groundwater contamination from methane migration, the impact of any chemical additives in the fracking fluid, treatment and disposal flowback fluid, greenhouse gas emissions and water usage. With regard to European work on this issue, uh, the EPA representing Ireland participates on an EU technical working group on the environmental aspects of unconventional fossil fuels, in particular shale gas. The working group consists of member states, the European Environment Agency and the EU Commission representatives. The purpose of the group is to assist in identifying and addressing knowledge gaps, potential key issues and priorities in relation to environmental protection, to act as a platform for information exchange on environmental aspects of and best practices of shale gas projects, and to contribute to the Commission's efforts to assess whether the existing environmental legislation ensures an appropriate level of protection of the environment and human health. Climate change also needs to be addressed in the context of uh, discussing fracking uh, operations. The EPA has a number of key roles in Ireland's response to the challenges of climate change. These include to provide Ireland's annual greenhouse gas inventory, which is reported to the EU and the UNFCCC and used to determine compliance with emissions targets under the Kyoto Protocol and also future EU climate and energy package. To also to provide official projections of future emissions of greenhouse gases in the context of projected policies and measures. The EPA projections for the period 2011 to 2020 show that Ireland can comply with our Kyoto obligations with regard to greenhouse gas emissions. However, that we are predicted to breach our annual obligations under the EU 2020 target from 2017 onwards, even under a best case scenario. 
Also, the total emissions are projected to be between 4.1 and 7.8 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent above the EU 2020 target. Globally, carbon dioxide and methane are the two most important long-life greenhouse gases driving climate change. In this regard, it is important to note that methane is the main constituent of natural gas. At the point of conversion to energy, fossil methane is less carbon intensive than other fossil energy sources, such as coal, oil or peat. Fuel switching from coal, peat or oil to natural gas has a climate benefit at the point of use in that the amount of carbon dioxide em emitted per equivalent amount of heating or electricity generation is lowered. The conversion of home heating from coal to gas in Dublin is a good example of this in that it had significant co-benefits for air quality and has contributed to lowering Ireland's emissions from this sector. Fugitive greenhouse gas emissions from oil and gas exploration, production and processing are included in greenhouse gas inventories. For Ireland, currently such life cycle emissions are low as most of our natural gas is imported, with approximately 93% imported in 2011. Any methane emission from fracking or during exploration drilling would be reported in Ireland's inventory. While uncertainties are significant, the use of locally produced shale gas to replace imported gas is likely to increase associated emissions for Ireland. While the level of such an increase is uncertain and may not be large, it would add to our total emissions and have implications for other sectors such as the agricultural sector. If such a gas is used to replace coal or peat or certain oil using systems, it may reduce the associated emissions. However, uh, such a transition needs to be assessed in the context of overall climate policy. As you will know, NESC have been tasked to report on the development of climate policy in Ireland. The first part on 2020 targets was published earlier this month. The second part, which will consider Ireland's transition to a low carbon economy, is due to be completed by the end of the year. Natural gas will have an important role in such a transition. However, its use needs to be factored into a clear transition scenario. That is, relatively lower emission methane systems replacing higher emissions coal, peat and oil systems, which are then replaced by sustainable energy sources over a period of time. In summary, Mr Chairman, further research is required to fully understand the potential impacts on the environment from the use of this technology. The key questions this research needs to answer are whether this technology can be used whilst also fully protecting the environment and human health, and if so, what is the best environmental practice in using the technology? The question of whether the existing EU environmental regulatory framework is adequate for unconventional fossil fuel projects is also being addressed. The answers to these questions will assist the agency and other regulators in fulfilling our statutory roles with regard to these projects. In conclusion, I hope I have given the Committee an overview of the possible environmental implications of hydraulic fracturing, and myself and my colleagues will be happy to answer any questions the Committee members may have for us. Thank you, you have, and, 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 and we thank you sincerely for that. Uh, before I, I go to the members, can I just ask you, can, you know, can I take it that no licenses will be given without the EPA approving it? Is that well, um, as I uh, stated in this, the opening statement, our role is in the commercial extraction, um, and a license will be required from the EPA for commercial extraction. For the uh, exploration licence, the EPA doesn't have a role other than being a statutory consultee with regard to an environmental impact assessment associated with that licence. Okay. Right. Over to the committee. Haskell. A few questions. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ms Burke. appreciate the comprehensive nature of your presentation. Uh, is there an understanding that the shale gas components uh, that it would be made up in this country or is there enough geological evidence to indicate that it could be different to other countries that our geological makeup could be different to other countries have you got any indication of that uh, what sort of criteria are you going to use in terms of putting forward this report uh, i know you've outlined a variety of different issues but it seems to me from the little i know about this is that there are different procedures used in different countries and particularly most of the information is coming out of america um, uh, for example, currently chemicals are being used, uh, and yet the um, Tamboran, particularly, who are the leading company in this area, 
have been stating repeatedly that they will not use uh, chemicals, that they will use water only. Um, so because of where the shale gas is being proposed to be extracted, uh, it's a high area of water content in terms of lakes and rivers, uh, which I think is unlike some of the American experiences where they're in the desert, where they're in totally different topography. So will you be taking that into account uh, in terms of the criteria you'll be laying down? What is, it that, what is it that you're going to be looking for? What is it that we can expect to get at the end of this report? Um, you've also indicated that you're tracking what's happening in other countries, uh, and you've, you've referred to the, the American report. Um, yet there still, does, there still seems to be a great deal of controversy surrounding the actual procedures. So are you going to be issuing a report that will focus on how, how the, the gas is to be extracted and what sort of safeguards uh, will be built into that particular procedure? Um, I appreciate that it's difficult at this remove to be able to answer these questions but, because you're just starting out. But based on the preliminary report that was issued by the uh, University of Aberdeen, uh, what sort of conclusions have you come to at this stage? Can you give any indication of what the thinking of the EPA is? Now, there may be other questions, but that's just a generality because I know others wish to get involved. Yeah, and just to remind members that we do have regulations or rules that... It's just, just my, my, my main point about it is we're concerned about the possible contamination of groundwater. Uh, that's the main concern uh, out of all of this. Yeah, that, it's two minutes for questions that we have, so just I'm trying. Um, Michael is next. Uh, Michael. That pointed at Michael, Chair. Aaron, I really should be a hint. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I st I'm still unclear. Does an, does an exploratory license permit hydraulic fracturing in North Leitrim? The, uh, that, that question, I, I got an answer to it, but maybe I don't understand the answer. It's not clear to me. Second thing is this. In, in all of this document, apart from pointing out that people have a right to make a submission. We're talking about environmental impact. We're talking about potential for poisoning groundwater, etc., etc. There's nothing in this in relation to the impact that this development would have on the people who live in North Leitrim. And, and, and this is something I've, I've noticed from, from reading the experience of, of those who live in, in other jurisdictions where hydraulic fracturing um, is going on, that nobody listened to the concerns of the people. And it's not just concerns in relation to the poisoning of the groundwater. It's not just concerns in relation to the potential damage to the agri-food business or the tourism business. The concerns were that a beautiful area, and this is why, Chairman, I suggested that we visit North Leitrim, that a beautiful agricultural area with drumland hills, lakes, rivers, mountains and valleys is turned into an industrial wasteland. It makes, this makes an impact on people. And prior to my election last year, I was a Leitrim County Councillor. And somebody applying for a house and to put a septic tank in the area where we're now considering putting seven acre concrete pads. People were turned down because the house, a family home, would be intrusive on the landscape. And I frankly can't understand why we're even considering allowing exploratory hydraulic fracturing in this area. And right. the, could somebody explain it to me, please? Right. And um, yes. Thank you, Chair. It's, it's really just um, some comments um, rather than um, an actual question. And it's really to do with um, the biggest concern, of course, seems to be uh, groundwater contamination. And um, seeing as how we depend so heavily on our groundwater, uh, I have to take up Deputy Kulrevi's point, I have to even wonder why we're even considering this. 
if you look at the examples of what's coming from other countries, each individual country seems to be going about it in different ways. The UK seems to have an open mind on it. France have closed it down. Germany is exploring. Poland is exploring. Uh, different uh, in intelligence, I suppose, seem to be coming from North America and um, Australia. But I suppose the difference with fracking in Ireland, if I was able to project as forward, is that centres of population are so close, dependency on the water is so close, it's much easier to do, I could, Im I could imagine how much easier it is to do fracking in the middle of Australia, where the um, nearest uh, centre of population might be, even by air, five, mi five hours away by air, so you can imagine the distance. Um, I, I think at this stage it's just too much in its infancy even to be um, even considering it, I think, in any real way. I, I think we would do much better if we watched what the, um, the intelligence is coming out from other countries before I think we, we try to do anything in a meaningful way with fracking. Thank you. Deputy Luke Neil Flanagan. Yeah, um, uh, it's a similar question to what I asked the, the, the last group. Just, uh, I'm interested to hear a comment from the EPA on the report uh, that came out from the European Parliament uh, expressing uh, serious concerns uh, about the, the technology. And uh, that's basically what I'd like to know. John? Yeah, thanks, Chairman. Uh, just, just to ask um, the EPA as to. I suppose what lessons um, as a new technology have you learned from other countries that you will obviously be taking into consideration when it comes to you um, making your decision and just if you can um, repeat as to the date that you expect to make a decision on the commercial uh, license and just if you can comment as well on what link ups you'd have with other uh, environmental agencies in the other countries what and um, you know to ensure that you're right up to date with what's actually happening in in all these other countries thank you and just in relation to that can i ask as well to, as a follow-up to what deputy Fanning has said have you seen it in other countries have the epa been actually visited other countries to see the impact yeah and just maybe if there's not anybody else i'll hand it over to you okay um First of all, just uh, I suppose with regard to the geology, um, Ireland is different and it's different to whether it's Australia or the US and that really is, um, I suppose, a prime driver of the research. Um, the EPA's role is to protect the environment. Um, science is at the core of all of our activities. And I hope I was clear in the statement to identify that we don't have the information available to us at the moment in order to make a decision on whether this technology uh, can be operated without harming human health or the environment. And that really is the key purpose of the research. Um, there is research happening at international and European level. Um, but Part of the research that we're looking at doing uh, in conjunction with the other bodies is to look at baseline studies to characterise the existing local environment in Ireland. So to address the question of the local geology and local issues. And I think that is a key part of the research. So what we don't want to do is duplicate research that's happening at a European level or happening in other countries, but to localise it uh, so that we have the data then on which to make um, a decision. Um, and you're absolutely right, water and compliance uh, with the Water Framework Directive is a key criteria with regard to any of these activities because we cannot have a situation that any activity would undermine um, Ireland's compliance with good water quality under our EU obligations and also the fact that water is a significant uh, resource for the country and uh, that can't be undermined. So really the research is to get an awful lot of baseline information with regard to the Irish situation. Uh, with regard to um, the impact on, of the development in North Leitrim, as I stated uh, in my opening address, the, it's not only the EPA that are, I suppose, progressing this research, but we're ve we were very keen and we have organised that the steering committee is, uh, has representatives, as I said, at DCNR, the Department of Environment, the Commission for Energy Regulation, who will be a regulation in this regard, and Borplanola, um, 
GSI and the Northern Irish Environment Agency. So all the regulators that would have a role at some stage into the future with regard to regulation of the activity are included in the steering committee so that any issues raised by themselves as well can be addressed. So really it's to try and pull together all of the bodies with a role together in the context of the research. Um, with regard to the European Parliament report, of course, that will also feed into the research that we've done, uh, or that we're doing, um, and we're very conscious of the findings of that report and other reports. Um, it's important to note in the context of that report, there was discussion about thresholds of environmental impact assessment it was one of the findings um, that, that needed to be looked at. In the Irish case, environmental uh, impact assessment would be done, as, as indicated by uh, DCNR, for the exploratory phase. In addition to that, with regard to the regulatory framework, um, again, Ireland is slightly different in that under our EPA Act and under our IPPC licensing regime, shale gas exploration is specifically included uh, as uh, a operation that would require a license. That isn't the case in other um, member states. With regard to links to other environment agencies, uh, as I indicated, we are on the EU technical working group with regard to shale gas, but also uh, both myself and, and members of the senior management of the EPA would be on a network of environmental protection agencies throughout Europe. Um, and I can say the fracking is something that is being discussed uh, uh, on that group um, as a key upcoming uh, issue. Uh, we haven't, as of yet, visited um, a fracking operation uh, in another country, um, and, but I'm sure that that will happen in the time period between now and when we have to make uh, any decision on such an activity. Um, I think, yeah. When, when do you expect us to uh, confirm again the date as a decision will be made on a oh. commercial? On the, on the commercial, I, I think there's such a process to go through. In the first instance, the research has to be completed. Post that, there would have to be an exploration license, and it would only be at the end of an exploration license that any application would come to the agency. Um, so I couldn't give you a time scale, but I certainly think there would be significant time between now and when we would even receive an application for commercial extraction. And again, that's the purpose of being proactive and doing the work now so that we have the data in advance of any license application. Yeah, Deputy Bing Clelligan. Yeah, just to, in relation to uh, it, 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 the question was asked, a very important question, like have you visited uh, any of these uh, uh, fracking uh, sites anywhere else in the world? Um, yeah, obviously you will be in the future, but I hope you will. And if you are, um, uh, is there any chance you can bring someone from Board Falls with you just to see, uh, do they think it's a lovely place to visit? Because they will be kind of important, because uh, if they don't think it's too lovely, well, it's a good indicator that you won't be getting many people coming to North Leitrim then if it comes there, will you? I think um, we and, uh, Sorry, and actually, Tambor, the person from Tambor, the man from Tambor and Resources were quite disparaging about how beautiful the place was. He, he didn't seem to think uh, there was much potential for tourism at all, so I don't know. It's, uh, as a family in Leitrim, I certainly appreciate the, uh, the, the beauty of Leitrim. Um, I suppose what I would say is we need to ensure that any new activity uh, that commences does not undermine what we currently have, which is a very good quality environment in Ireland. That has an intrinsic value in its own right, as I'm sure all of this committee are aware. But also it has a very important value for tourism and agricultural industries, for example. In addition, as you're, and we've talked about the water resources, um, in addition, water resources are predicted to become of increasing strategic importance to Ireland. Um, and we have to protect those. So uh, any action that is taken into the future can't undermine, uh, as I said, our water quality or other industries. So again, it's back to evidence-based decision-making, and we need to have the research done and completed in order to assist us to base any decision into the future. Um, but of course we need to take into consideration local considerations in Ireland. And again, that's not only why it's the EPA on the steering committee of the, uh, of the, uh, on the research, but also organisations such as uh, CEO, Borplanol, etc., all who have their own distinct regulatory roles in this regard. Uh, Michael, did you? Sorry. Uh, Chairman, uh, again I'll ask. 
does exploratory license uh, allow hydraulic fracturing? Do we have to frack in order to get the information to see whether fracking is safe? As I indicated earlier, the EPA does not have a role on the exploration license other than as a statutory consultee on the environmental impact assessment. So, unfortunately, I, I cannot give you an answer with regard to that. That so, will be the So, DCO. hydraulic fracturing could... Do, do you, can it be permitted under an exploratory license, notwithstanding the EPA role in, 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 in uh, approving or not approving? Is it within the gift of the minister or the department or whoever grants an exploratory license to say you can carry out hydraulic fracturing in order to test the safety, etc., of hydraulic fracturing? Sorry, that is a question for DCNOR in the context of an exploration I did, I, license. I did ask them. Um, yes. And I say it's just because we do not issue the exploration license. I said we are consultee with regard to that license. That is a function of DCNOR. I yeah. put on a PQ on it. That's makes it an answer, yes. Uh, okay, can you... Sorry, sorry. very briefly. Uh, you mentioned about your bilateral discussions internationally. Are you having bilateral discussions with your absent numbers in the UK? There is an EPA agency in the UK. Yes, um, uh, are you uh, dealing with them uh, in terms of the Northern Ireland situation because, as I said earlier on, I mean, geology knows no borders, and it's already evident that the activities that they're proposing to take, to, to take place in Fermanagh will have a direct impact across the border into Leitrim because it's got part of the same northwestern shale area. So where does that leave you? If, for example, I know we've been anticipating here, but supposing you come down against hydraulic fracturing as being um, having an adverse impact on the environment? And yet Northern Ireland, because the Brits are already now talking about offering uh, tax incentives to, fr to fracturing companies, uh, that they would go ahead. I mean, where does that leave us? Because it's going to be having a direct impact on our environment. It's a bit like having urinating and non-urinating sections in the swimming pool. Yes. 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 I'll try and put that image out of my mind for one moment. Oh, no. <laughs> um, yes, uh, we are talking to our colleagues in the UK, but more importantly, we have the Northern Irish Environment Agency on the steering committee for the research um, as well. And in the context of uh, any activities happening in Northern Ireland, uh, there would need to be, uh, in, in the context of environmental impact assessment, a transboundary uh, uh, element to that and consultation element uh, to it. But we, were very, uh, we felt it was very important to have the Northern Irish Environment Agency, and I'd have to say they were also very keen to be involved in the research so that they can have the data themselves uh, and work with us to have the appropriate data in which to make decisions with regard to fracking. So, the Chair, can, can, they, can they make unilateral decisions? or will they have to rely on a British government decision? I mean, can they make their own autonomous decisions in relation to the future of factory? Um, sorry, with, with regard to the uh, a license mm. to operate, um, my understanding um, is that they have the independence to make decisions themselves. But really, now, as I said, I can't claim to be an expert on what the Northern Irish Environment, Environment Agency's roles are or not may be. So um, I, I can't definitively state with regard to that. OK. Uh, with that, I want to thank you, Ms. Laura Burke, and your colleagues for uh, being so informative and helpful and helping the committee in their deliberations. So you're now excused. Them. Thank you very much. Next, we have the Good Energies Alliance representatives. So we'll give them a minute. We'll suspend for a minute or two.
Uh, we're back in public session. I want to wel welcome representatives of Good Energies Alliance Ireland uh, here to brief the committee in relation to fracking. I welcome Dr. Aidan McLaughlin, Mr. Liam Breslin, Mr. Eddie Mitchell and Ms. Anish Gerbood of Good Energies Alliance. I wish to draw your attention to the fact by virtue of sec Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you are di directed by a committee to cease giving ev evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I also wish to advise you that the opening statements you have submitted to the committee will be published on the committee's website after this meeting. Members are reminded of long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on or criticise or make charges against any person outside the House or an official either by name uh, or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I want to allow you now to make a presentation. Garamaga is up in Kura Hokshiv Thum, Benjan Yu. Ta Anna has Aram Venlot, Benon Large Liv, Fween Chonskal Shah, Ta Agira Chakaheran, and Chonskal Gosh, Ozarjan Frakal Talov, Conan Gosh of Ru on Divness. Ta Sulagon Gamay non picture a hoach jeeve, than Docker a Yenoksha shoot than Talov, that launch a dina, Augustan Chonskal Talavir. A talko tautak in Erin. Chairman, TDs, Senators, ladies and gentlemen. In this statement, I will give the committee an overview of what is meant by fracking, a picture of the scale of the project proposed and its impacts on its land. I'll then address the risks of contamination of groundwater. I know that has been discussed already, but um, I think that some of the pictures might give a better view of what exactly is the problem here and the impacts on health. And finally, I will deal with the promise of jobs and the social impacts of this boom and bust industry. The first thing slide shows that onshore shale gas extraction is not the same thing as a North Sea oil or gas rig. In conventional shale gas extraction, there's a reservoir of gas underneath, and a few wells can extract vast volumes of gas. For example, in the Corrup gas field, five wells can extract one trillion cubic feet, not one billion, one cu trillion cubic feet of gas. On the other hand, in unconventional gas extraction, the target area is deeper, and the gas has to be released by high vo volume hydraulic fracturing and thousands of wells may be needed to extract the same volume of gas. And in the northwest, the proposal is to take over 156 square miles of area, industrialize it, build 120 paths and drill 3,000 wells. So you're talking about a scale of a project that cannot be compared with a conventional proposal. This is a picture of what we're looking at actually coming to Ireland. And I'm not just not talking about North Leitrim. I'm talking about Fermanagh. I'm talking about Clare. I'm talking about other places where, where uh, proposals may be made for shale gas extractions. These paths are seven acres each and it's proposed to put them one every square mile throughout the target area. And 24 wells are to be drilled from each pad, 3,000 in total. This is the Tamboran pro proposal for North Leitrim and, and Fermanagh. We don't know what kind of um, proposal is going to be put out for, for Clare at the moment. And this is a picture of a pad in North River in British Columbia. And soon after this picture was actually published, there was a report showing that there's over 40 seismic, uh, seismic events recorded where there was no such thing 
before 2009. And as we all know, in the UK, earthquakes were caused by the first two wells drilled, and the target area in Ireland is highly faulted. There are an awful lot of geological faults, and therefore we do have a high risk of the same thing happening in Ireland. If you want to know what the area would look like after they were finished, now we're talking here not about the exploratory um, stage, we're talking about what would happen if it went on to the production stage. I see this very much as like a juggernaut. Here we have just the start at the moment, but if it goes to the exploratory stage and the results are good, well then this is what we can look forward to in the rural areas of Ireland. And in fact, not only in the rural areas, if the area is good, it will creep towards centres of population. This is DISH in Texas. And if you look at Google Earth and you key in Dimmock in Pennsylvania, or Alberta in Canada, you'll find exactly the same thing. The only difference is, in those places, there are no people. Here, there certainly are, throughout the length and breadth of Ireland. As we all know, the countryside is dotted with little villages and little communities that have been there all their lives and for generations before. This is the map of Ireland, Northwest Ireland, that shows exactly where the, where the proposal is going to be situated. The red circle is the uh, area proposed by Tamborne for the first phase, and that is supposed to um, have 3,000 wells drilled within it. And the blue circle shows where they could go after that in the same kind of area, because the shale here is very thick. It's over 700 metres thick. And so they can go right down around Loch Allen, into the Shannon, into the area of the Shannon River, where they are now is actually the Shannon catchment, which is also linked with the Erne catchment. So whatever is done in Fermanagh will also affect the south. And similar areas are found in Clare, extending down through Limerick into North Kerry and Cork. So there are an awful lot of other counties that would want to be aware that this is the kind of proposal that is on the table. Here we have, um, here we have a sort of a, a bird's eye view of what the area proposed for fracking would look like with the pads. And I have a few um, animations here that are going to make a twinkly kind of uh, an effect. But it just gives you an idea of the kind of density of the paths that would be there. It doesn't show the access roads, it doesn't show the gas pipelines, it doesn't show the huge machinery that's involved, but it would have huge consequences for the land. And here we have areas of high visual amenity and vast underground water and cave systems and blanket bogs. There is no room in this scenario for the farms that are there. Farms that may live, uh, survive for a while will have contamination problems. And if there is a rumour of contamination entering the food chain, that could have a disastrous consequence for the agriculture throughout Ireland, not just in this part of the world. Now, we're looking here at uh, a diagram of under the ground. The lower, the lower line is actually the depth of the Barnett Shale in the US. And as you can see, it's very, very deep indeed. It goes from 1,500 metres to 3,000, one to two miles below the ground. And obviously, whatever happens at that distance is very far away from the surface of the water. The vertical lines up and down from the first, from the more horizontal one, shows the depth of the kind of fractures that are caused by hydraulic fracturing. They can go up to 580 metres, and at that depth you could say, well, maybe they won't do any harm. But here is the groundwater depth. We've just been told that the groundwater can go down to 150 metres below the ground, and here is where they're proposing to frack in Ireland. The shale is a lot shallower. It goes from 500 
to 1,250 meters. So obviously, if you have the same kind of fracture and the same length of fractures, they will have a great, uh, there will be a high risk of contamination of the aquifers. This slide shows a very simplified, any geologist here will cringe, I know, but it, is, it does give an idea of the different layers that are in the area that we're talking about. We've shallow aquifers towards the top, we've layers of rock, and then we have the shale target area, which would again be between 500 and 1250 metres. What is very unusual, and here we're talking about the geology of North Leitrim, that underneath the uh, shale layer, there is another aquifer. It is quite extraordinary. It is called the Ballyshannon limestone because it rises to the top in Ballyshannon. That's where, why it was named that. But this, when it comes towards the top, is actually the source of the water supply in Ballyshannon and South Donegal. So people from that area would need to be very aware of that, that that layer goes deep down into the ground, down under the shale layer. At that depth, it is very dense and water doesn't flow. But the next slide will show what happens when we... Fra or the next animations will show that the drill goes down to the shale layer, then across. That's fine, but then you get fractures all along. And if the fractures are the same kind of length as what we were shown in the previous slide, just have a look. They are fracking not only the aquifer underneath, but can go up into the aquifer above. So this is what is the cons could be the consequence. I'm not saying will be, but certainly could be the consequence of fracking, uh, of shallow fracking in an area where there's an aquifer below as well as above. When the aquifer is fracked, it is, it is shattered. That's what fracking actually means. It is shattered and therefore it becomes more permeable and where there's little flow of water, when it's not touched, once fracking occurs, there is no reason why water couldn't flow. And I have been given that advice by a hydrogeologist. At the top, you can see the kind of scale. I have a little drill there. Believe you me, these drills, our drill derricks, are enormous. They are about 100 feet high, and they are extraordinarily powerful. So what are the risks? I've already had a look at some of them. Um, there are the risks to, um, to the groundwater from cement casing failures, which is a big problem. The uh, wells are supposed to be protected from the land by cement. Very difficult to form a bond between cement and the kind of clay soil that we are, clay ground that we see in, um, in the areas being drilled. And they very often failed. And the incidence of failure is actually higher as the wells grow older. And we still don't know at the end of the day just what that is going to mean from the point of view of the tra uh, travelling of fluids or gases. We also have fluids or gases moving through fractures or faults, as I was explaining, and they can get to groundwater sources. Accidents cause spillages and contamination of, of lakes and streams. We cannot um, legislate for accidents, but we do know from industry, uh, from industry papers that the rate of accidents causing pollution events is about 21% of the wells drilled. And that is, you know, the industry was actually congratulating itself that it had halved the number of accidents. But that was the actual rate, 21% of the number of, well, of wells drilled. There are huge volumes of contaminated wastewater, which, are, which nobody has, sorry, I'm going to go back there, that um, nobody has actually uh, said how, they are, how that is going to be treated. It's going to be very difficult because it's high in salts and all sorts of things like that. Um, there's methane leaking into the air, and of course, you, you need a thousand vehicles 
to build a pad with a well. Um, we're talking about 60 pads, 3,000 wells, so obviously air pollution, traffic fumes, dust and ozone are going to be a big problem. And if that wasn't bad enough, then we have to look at what the effects on health are. Now, we have chemicals going down in the fracking fluid, and we've also got a whole, um, another range of substances that are added from below. The nine most common chemicals found in fracking fluids all have serious effects on human and animal health. This slide was produced by an organization that is actually researching the effect of chemicals and are very reputable. And as you can see, they have, there are effects on the whole body, on the nervous system, on the endocrine system, on the respiratory system, on, um, on the kidneys, on the gastrointestinal system, and on the reproductive system. And really, um, if you look at those nine chemicals, the slide doesn't show it in detail, but we have anything from biocides to bi uh, petroleum products, to um, breakers, to um, gel makers, all of those chemicals are used. The idea of, of having fracking without chemicals is totally impossible. Um, from a chemist's point of view, all substances are chemicals. So whether you're using sand and water, that is a mixture of chemicals in the real sense of the word. And from the point of view of the present day technology, to, um, the technology of using this, this industry without chemicals just isn't there at the moment. The other thing I would like to say is that we do not know what the long term effects are yet. High density, high volume hydraulic fracturing is, is a very new industry. It's only there for about the last seven years. So the long term effects have not been studied and the studies are in fact only starting now. And of course, as well as that, you have to look at the effect on the communities, the stress, the disruption, the absolute um, deterioration of the quality of life that they are going to, uh, they're, they're going to have. So, um, the other, another thing that uh, proposal is that this, this industry is going to bring a lot of jobs. And I would like to point out, this is a pattern of the jobs found in the States. That initially, you do get a lot of workers. Each, each um, well requires about 400 workers to get it established. But I would like to point out that, that those jobs are not cumulative, that workers move from well to well. So therefore, you, have, you certainly do have numbers, but not thousands. They're reckoned in hundreds. And they are largely migrant workers, teams brought in by the um, oil companies that have no relationship either to the land or to the people that live there. And it is a boom and bust, as you can see, there is a kind of a cycle where um, the company is proposing a 15-year cycle and in so for, this is for the development phase and in that situation the people will come in and they'll go. Um, there are much fewer long-range jobs with 60 pads in Leitrim probably around 180 jobs. That would be kind of what would be expected with the intensity of the operation. And if you look at what is there at the moment, the whole, the population is hugely engaged in agriculture and tourism throughout the target areas of Fermanagh and Leitrim and Clare and into North Kerry and all the rest of it. I mean, it, these jobs coming in mean huge displacement of jobs on the ground. Where there is a possibility that farming can be uh, disrupted, well then we have the, 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 four, the, the picture of an awful lot of jobs being lost, much more than jobs being created. And indeed, the past, uh, the past experience in the US during the development phase is that there is a sudden infl influx of new people into the area. And that does have its own challenges in housing, in culture, and in the public services. 
400 doesn't sound an awful lot coming into Dublin. Bring it into a rural area all of a sudden, and then there are definite problems there. There are increasing in social problems because there will be the haves and the have-nots, those that are making a lot of money, those that are making none. And unfortunately, where you have migrant populations like that coming off their work going into a community, well then you do have increases in social problems like crime, health, mental health problems, community dissatisfaction and conflict. And unfortunately, wherever this industry is, it is well known and documented that it is followed by increased um, incidences of alcohol, drug problems and prostitution. So they're the kind of, uh, of, that's the kind of future that may be before us in the areas where they operate. And finally there, of course, we have public health problems that I was talking about, allergies, respiratory, immune. The difference between this is, and the previous slide, it's another, it's another organization that is actually pointing this out, and it is a very reputable organization. So, um, all of this will mean that we have, a, uh, we have a scenario here where we have a choice. Do we go down this path or do we not? Even the talk about giving exploratory license does have an implication for the granting of production licenses. So, what we are saying is that we need a clear commitment by the government that they will not issue any licenses for onshore shale gas exploration or development, and it must be adopted by the government as policy that high-volume hydraulic fracturing will be prohibited in Ireland. We are not saying that there can be no uh, investigation of alternative en of technologies or energies, but this technology should not be allowed in Ireland. Thank you very, very much. much indeed. A very comprehensive overview. Can I just ask, in relation to this, just a very simple question, and I get around to the members, but just this very powerful drill that's going down, and you said the sand, sand cannot be put in with it. Is there not sand already in the, in the ground in relation to, you know, I mean, why, you know, I, I didn't get where you were coming from there. Right, okay. Um, the process is this, that they drill down. Let's just do the vertical drill first, okay? They drill down, and at that drill, of course, they're drilling through, through sand and all. They put what's called a, uh, a slick fluid down there to reduce the friction. And then, um, as they're drilling, the drilling mud comes up, all right? Then they put down a steel tube and put concrete outside it to bond it to whatever rock is there. And I was saying that there was a problem with the bond. But the middle of it is clear. So there's no sand down there. And that goes with the horizontal one as well. So that when they're fracturing, they have to push down um, water containing sand. And to keep the sand in the water, they have a gelling substance. And that then keeps the forces, forces um, itself through the shale and then keeps the fractures open. Okay. Right, all the members? Yeah. Ask it. Like, uh, thank you, Aidan, for, Aidan, for a very, very comprehensive uh, overview. And, uh, Just pass it to them. We'll take all the questions because we're here, we'll be here. So if you can take a note and you can respond then. Because yeah, we'll be I, I just want to thank her for her presentation and also to thank her and her group for, for highlighting this issue over the last 18 months um, in, in the areas that have been affected. I just want to ask one or two questions because I think that everything you've said is self-evident. Firstly, have you been at all encouraged by what you have heard this morning from the regulatory agencies, from both the department and from the EPA? The impression given, at least from my perspective or my interpretation, is that nothing is going to happen in the short term, uh, that, or even the medium term, um, that the uh, company, uh, Tamboran particularly, whatever about Clare, that they are now, in my opinion, caught in the horns of a dilemma because it has been made perfectly clear that if they don't apply for a license in February, uh, that it will fall. Uh, and yet they're saying by their correspondence to this committee that they're not going to do anything until 
uh, all of the EPA reports and all the other technology reports are concluded. So that's, it's in that context I'm asking you, are you encouraged uh, that th there is um, a, an attempt being made both by the department and particularly the department and to a lesser extent by the EPA to tread cautiously in relation to this and how would you respond to what you have heard? Also, uh, are you saying that you will not accept uh, hydraulic fracturing under any circumstances in relation to the current technology, that you, you see it as being uh, absolutely damaging to the environment and that there is no, you've made it quite clear in your conclusions, that high volume uh, fracking should be prohibited. H have you from your research got any indication whatsoever worldwide that there are, will be improvements in technology or that we could arrive at a position where um, shale gas could be extracted without there being the sort of infrastructure, which is quite horrendous, I mean, it's like a lunar landscape, um, <clears throat> uh, w would, be, would be unnecessary. Um, and thirdly and finally, in the context of Ireland, um, are you encouraged by the fact that it is perfectly clear that the geology of Ireland is totally different to that of the other countries, uh, and that that might be an encouraging factor in that, because there's such a high volume of water, lakes, rivers, etc., in <clears throat> the area that's been proposed, uh, that the chances are that ultimately that the government may decide that it's just not worth, worth, the, worth the candle. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michael? Uh, thank you, Chairman. I, I have to say that, listen to this, this morning's meeting, I, I wouldn't be as comforted at the proceedings as Senator Mooney, and, and in fact, I'm probably more concerned now than I was before I walked in I'm here. Only yeah, I didn't yeah. say I was. I, I, okay, okay. <clears throat> Correction accepted. Uh, thank you, Eddie. I know because I've attended a number of meetings that, 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 that you've had in the community that, as an organisation, yet you you've had extensive communications with the, the local community throughout North Leitrim and beyond. Can you describe for the committee the concerns that are there? Can you identify whether even the talk of hydraulic fracturing has had an impact on house values, investment decisions, that sort of an area. Uh, can you describe the fears and concerns that, the local, that local people have communicated to you during these meetings? And if you could, in a sentence, do, do, do you detect the potential for conflict within the community of North Leitrim over hydraulic fracturing? And if you could, in a sentence, describe the optimal outcome from these discussions? What would that be? John? Thanks, Chairman. Again, uh, Senator Money has more or less covered what I was going to ask, but just maybe to rephrase it a little bit. Is, is there any guarantees that could be given uh, by any regulatory authority that would in any way influence uh, your, your views that you have put to us? Or is there any technology that you could see in the future uh, that would change your view on how maybe the gas could be extracted by not, not damaging the environment. You mentioned that, and I've been the devil's advocate here because I, I obviously I think that the community's view should be, should be uppermost in, 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 in any decision that's taken. Uh, but on the one hand, you give a very you know, definitive facts. If, if people never heard of fracking, until your presentation this morning, the, the, immediate, the immediate influence would be this, we shouldn't touch this. Uh, but on the one hand, then you said that it's too early to decide because the technology is only seven years. We're not sure of the effects. I just wonder, is there a, is there a slight contradiction maybe in, 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 we'll say, the definitive facts you gave in affecting health, and on the other hand, saying maybe that it's too early because we don't know the long-term effects. So, uh, 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 just being the devil's advocate in that. So, thank you. Um, uh, first off, uh, thanks for the excellent presentation uh, you're uh, doing. Uh, 
the country a service, and you're making my job a lot easier as well because uh, I can. Uh, you have collated facts that, uh, on my own, I just wouldn't have been able to put together. And I don't really have an awful lot of questions. I think you, you've answered an awful lot of questions that I have, but I would suggest that uh, people here and anyone who's listening to this take you up on your invite to have a look at Dima, Pennsylvania on Google Earth, because I'm looking at it now. And uh, like we can't, you could, some people can say water may be poisoned in the future, it may not or whatever, and people can debate it back and forward. But there is no debate over the fact that I am looking at a horrifically ugly landscape in front of me here now. And if it goes ahead, definitively, no one can argue with this, there will be no tourism in that part of Leitrim. That is definite. Because I certainly would not bring my kids on holidays so that they could we go and look at one pad and then a kilometre down, mile down the road, we look at another big lump of concrete. I really suggest look at Google Earth and look at that. Because if you look in close, you kind of go, my God, there's a lot in that area. But if you start spreading out, it just goes on and on and on. And it's like, uh, you know, there's no debate. That is ugly and it will destroy tourism in, uh, in North Leitrim. Or if, they have a, if there's any ambition to really develop the tourism industry there, you can forget about it if we do this. There's, there's no doubt. Maybe in the future someone might be able to drill with one well and it will be perfect. Sure, have a look at it then. But at the moment, this is not a runner. That's all, all right. Yeah, thank you very much. Now, back to you, Dr. Okay. Um I'll deal first with um, Senator Mooney's um, questions. That was I encouraged by the department and the EPA? No, I wouldn't say I was encouraged. What I heard was what I expected, really, because we do know that this is what is happening, that um, there is a kind of a grey area emerging where the company is talking about one kind of timeline and the officials are talking about another kind of timeline and that's made even more complicated by the fact that it's over the border as well which is um, exactly which is which is con continuous with ourselves so um, talking about talking about not allowing um, anything to go forward I'm not sure at all that the licenses will be um, will be actually rendered void by this. I I, I can only assume that an, an, an extension will be required. I think we do need to have more attention paid to policy in the in the whole area and look at not only the technical aspects of it but the human aspects as well. When um, talking about hydraulic fracturing, specifically I said that high volume hydraulic fracturing should be prohibited. The reason for that is that all the evidence coming from where this is actually taking place is really showing that it is not a safe technology. Now, I personally, and this is absolutely, uh, I am not speaking on behalf of the campaign, I personally think that if there is um, new, a new technology that might, might look at, at uh, production of gas in a completely different way, perhaps for the good of the community, not to have it produced all of a sudden with huge industry and probably just go into the international store of gas rather than have it used for the, for the people themselves. I think we could be talking about a completely different scenario and that is why high volume hydraulic fracturing should be prohibited but not the research to go, uh, to go into what could be the future development of gas production because there's no doubt about it, we all need gas, use gas and know what its benefits are. Um, I do actually believe that, uh, at least um, being optimistic, I certainly would have the opinion that the geology is different in Ireland, and with this, that it may well be found that it isn't worth it. I do, I do agree there with, um, with, the, with the senator. Um, Michael, uh, 
um, Carl Reavy was talking about the community. There is an extraordinary situation happening in the local area, right, wherever this, this fracking is, is proposed, in Clare and Leitrim and Fermanagh. And that is that the people on the ground are, are really united um, behind a call to stop this process. And many of them are talking about having a ban on fracking. Now, the reason for this is that people are very, very afraid of what might happen to their lands, to their communities, to their health. Um, somebody was talking about that if we haven't, going back to the slide on health, that if we don't know what the long-term effects are, maybe that was a contradiction of what I said. But in fact, the short-term effects are what were in that slide. There are effects on people. It, this is happening now. People are coming to the doctors, to the hospitals with all of these kind of illnesses. The chemicals themselves, we know the long-term effects all right. But if you look at the communities, it takes more than seven years for certain diseases. And we're now beginning to see the cancers emerging and the other longer-term longer effects on human health. So we don't know the extent of those, but we do know what the start looks like. Um, another question I was asked were, if there were guarantees and if the technology was okay. Unfortunately, at the moment, there's more current disasters than uh, technology advances in this field. There is a lot going on, but um, as the technology is now, the proposal that is made is really unacceptable, in our view. I would like to ask um, Eddie Mitchell whether he could add something to this. <coughs> Um, thank you. Um, I just, John Manny spoke there about um, future technology and whether we would accept this under any conditions. Um, we would accept an industry if we seen a life cycle analysis of an industry. We're not going to see that with fracking. I'm talking about future future developments or future. Like the the people in in Leitrim and Fermanagh are 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 pro development. This is, this is not an anti-development or an anti-government campaign. We are, we're interested in, in farming and, and we're interested in tourism and man, clean manufacturing. And we want to see our areas develop in, in that way. Like if, if a policy was going to be developed for an industry, we, we would like to see a strategic environmental assessment. We'd like to see health impact assessments. We'd like to see debates on policy. And then we'd like to see people, people's, to, to educate themselves about that and then to make um, decisions based on knowledge. That, that's the kind of scenario we would like to see development progress in. We don't like to see development pushed in. And we're very concerned when we see the situation in Corrib and the way that the community was dealt with there. Because we don't. We did. We didn't see that community. Don't feel that they were um, done right by, and that community are still um, in the same position as they were 12 years ago. So we're looking at a huge project, much much bigger on land in North Leitrim, in in Cavan, in Fermanagh, it that will eventually develop across the Monaghan if we follow the shale. And remember that in order to exploit the shale and follow our demand for energy, we will have to, we will have to exploit the shale going forward. If, if we start to depend on unconventional gas as part of our energy mix, then we will exploit the shale that's there, which will mean over the next 30 years we will be moving across the border counties towards Fermanagh. And we want to make sure that anything like that is debated in public and the people understand like this is going to destroy agriculture in those areas and it's going to do damage to agriculture 
on, 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 a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on an international level. So I think that given our small population in Ireland, all Ireland, six and a half million people, we have to look to see whether the, the solutions that people are looking to in countries like Britain and Germany and America are they solutions for Ireland? And I don't think they are. I think that we depend on our green, clean image, and I think that's the way we should we should be very cautious. And that's why we've been calling for a ban, and that's why we have we want to see shale gas um, prohibited in Ireland. Well, just ask, Chairman, in light of the responses, do you not think it's feasible, keeping in mind your own recommendations? that the manner in which the state agencies are going about this process, uh, the Department have made it clear what their position is. They are relying on the EPA. The EPA have pointed out that they're not going to uh, issue anything, they're not going to get involved in anything until the research is completed. And accepting that the geology in Ireland is different, and you've made that point yourselves, that what's happening overseas is not necessarily applying to here. Would it not be more, is it not feasible that, that we as a country should ensure that we have compiled every available piece of information in relation to how this process would impact on the Irish environment, and at that point that a decision can then be taken, or at least that there can be the government, I mean ultimately as the Minister issues the licence, but that the consultative process you're talking about, I think it's built into the process anyway before anything can go ahead. But do you not think that, notwithstanding that the point, position you've taken, which I support, and you will continue to, to make that point, but what other alternative is there? I mean, you're asking that a decision be taken right now, whereas there is, in my opinion, and I wonder if you share the view, an absence of specific, of information specific to the Irish geology. Uh, and, and, and notwithstanding that the process, as we have seen it outlined, is horrendous. Uh, and that therefore would it not be would it not strengthen everybody's case that we had a definitive conclusion on exactly what our what it is uh, that would affect an impact on the Irish environment and that we would have our own conclusions not 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 American not Europe not anywhere else our own conclusion do you see a merit in that okay just maybe we get uh, Flanagan here um, uh Eddie, you mentioned uh, the uh, farming and uh, the effect that it would have on farming, now, whether that be to do with uh, potentially polluting the water supply or the fact that uh, a lot of the land will end up under concrete or the fact that uh, farmers that are going about doing their daily work will have to deal with trucks going up and down uh, their roads that they normally didn't have to deal with, uh, no doubt putting extra pressure on them, doing damage to them, making them more difficult to travel on. Given all of that, um, uh, what sort of a, is, the, is there much uh, being said by the farming organisations about this, or have you had uh, contact with them? Uh, what, what, what is their opinion on it, or have they been quiet? Okay. Yeah, um, I, I, I was at a meeting um, the other night with, with IFA and Cavan, and um, we discussed, the, I gave a presentation and we discussed hydraulic fracture, and uh, the room was stunned. People don't know yet about hydraulic fracturing. There's a lot of awareness in, in North Leitrim and West Fermanagh. And the national media haven't really um, allow, uh, you know, created a debate yet. I think they might start to do that. Well, just one other thing. I, I've been at a, a many a farmer meeting in my time and I've seen the crowd stunned. I've seen the top table do nothing about it. Has there been a position taken uh, by any of these farming organisations? Because I know ordinary farmers out there that I've spoken to are terrified of it. But uh, that doesn't seem to be uh, making its way to the top so for an official position to come out. Is there any, do you know? Or I, I think there's a process going on within the IFA. And I don't know where that's where that's getting. I think that actually, what the statement that was made to me was that that they're looking at what the EPA are saying. But what I've been saying to them is that they really should, at a regional level, they should do like what we've done. They should they should do their own research and they should they should allow they should encourage farmers to do their own research. Doctor. Um, I would like to answer Sen uh, Senator Mooney's uh, question. And that is that um, with regard to the investigations that are taking place, I 
feel myself that we're going down exactly the same route as has been taken before in other issues that turned out to be extraordinarily contentious and caused an enormous amount of division in the community. And that is that no public consultation is being taken at the moment. Um, no formal, for example, the, it, the steering group that is, has, that is sitting to look at the terms of reference of the new um, research document that I was listening to the list of organizations that were involved there is no community representation on that list and I think in a situation where um, a, a policy decision will mean direct uh, action in an area where there is a community, at least that community should be involved at every single stage. And we have reputable organisations, we have, we have experts involved in the campaign. There is absolutely no reason why, um, why people in the area that is going to be affected couldn't be involved in that. Um, also, um, the, the public consultation, to be talking about there will be public consultation at some phase, Th that is really not in the spirit of the Our House Convention. And I would just like to put it to the government that really they need to take the aspect of public participation in decision making an awful lot more seriously. Michael. Uh, yeah, just in, in relation to the farming organisations, I do know from meetings that at grassroots level, within, within, locally, within, within the farming organisations, there is serious concern, but it doesn't seem to be uh, um, expressed at national level. Interestingly, the Canadian Farming Association, which remained silent in relation to the issue of fracking until fracking happened in Canada, but the experience of their farmer members. Now has the Canadian Farming Association calling for a ban on any further fracking developments within Canada. I think what we have to do here is learn not to make the mistake rather than clean up the, the consequences of a mistake. Are you happy with... Well, I suppose, you know, overall today, I have to say, there's a huge amount of information given in here. It's on the you know, consultation is, is ongoing about this, and I think it will be it will help to educate the public. I think there is widespread concern that people need to be educated, and this morning's er, uh, exercise would definitely help on, on, on that line. Like, like just told me, a transcript of the meeting will be on the website later on in the afternoon. So, I propose, yeah. in light of the responses that we've had. <clears throat> that a recommendation should go from this committee to the EPA to include uh, Good Energies Alliance Ireland uh, on a consult consultative basis, uh, as they seem to be the credible uh, uh, um, anti-fracking group uh, representing, I think, the widespread views, I think all of us would agree, yeah, of the people that they impact on. Uh, that's all we can do is recommend, but at least it might carry some weight and I, I take the point that I think all of us would agree that it, it, by taking, accepting all of the names of all the people that are being involved in the EPA research, surely there is a need to have a community representative. Well, we, we can ask them that, and you know it has been. We can we can write to them and, and, and request that. Okay. Yeah, Chairman, could I also say that uh, it's wrong that a consultative committee like that doesn't have. On a, a, as part of his conversation with somebody who elects, who represents the people of an area. It, it, it's very wrong. F from a communications point of view, f from an awareness sharing point of view, f you know, the, the public representative can communicate both ways. Yeah. Okay, I'm taking it. Anything else? If there's not? Can, can I ask, will there be a meeting arranged for North Leitrim so that members can view the Back to or a visit. Yeah, I take your point that we, we, I don't know, it'll be a meeting arranged, but it's certainly a visit. Certainly a visit. It's certainly a visit. I, I was going to go further and suggest that the committee should give serious consideration to visiting one of the sites of, uh, of the current of a current hydraulic fracturing process. 
uh, that, that some consideration should be given to that as to where it might be is a new point. Could you think of that? Cheap flights to Poland. Well, yeah, or to Could you think of that? Or to like the there, 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 there are easily available TV footage of, of such sites, photographs of such sites. But if, if it would help, you see, I, I, I still don't know what, Im uh, what input, if any, this committee is going to have in relation to the decision whether or not to grant an exploratory license. The committee won't do this. I still don't know whether the exploratory license will permit hydraulic fracturing in order to test whether hydraulic fracturing is safe or unsafe. Yeah. So, well, look, the debate will continue. Yes, and as we all. do not agree, Chair, that as a committee, we, we, we have now started a process, which I, I initiated, yes, you along did. with others, I have said and said the first, that it was important. You pursued it. Well, what I said was that it was important that the committee, as a joint committee of this House, should be informed, firstly, that the yes. members of this the, of, of all houses, of all yeah. parties and none, should be informed. Yes. I think that this exercise this morning has done that. Yeah. We, we, so we, I would we achieved that. that. Yes, but I believe our mandate... And I'm sure the debate we had on the environment. Well, I was going to say that our mandate should be to continue to monitor. That, you know, it's yeah. not enough just to have yeah. this and then leave it until yeah. the state agencies decide. But I believe we should continue to monitor, and I would hope that uh, Dr McLaughlin and her group would continue to ensure that the committee continues to monitor. Well, I have no doubt about that they will. Okay. Thank you very much. And I want to thank the members that actually stayed on. And because we were just the longest meeting we had in a long time, even non members stayed on. So I appreciate that, uh, all your efforts. And indeed, thank you for coming in and being so informed. Thank you very much indeed. As there's no other business, gentlemen, um, we'll adjourn until Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, 17th. Thank you very much.